book starts out with a quote from Theodor Herzl, who is the founder of Zionism. We shall not take others unawares or mislead them any more than we shall deceive ourselves. Getting it, the transformation of my own personal relationship to the state of Israel has been a long, subtle, slow, stubborn journey that has taken a lifetime. One of the strangest things about willful ignorance regarding Israel and Palestine is how often progressive people, like myself, with histories of community activism and awareness, engage in it. In this way, it somewhat parallels the history of homophobia and that there are emotional blocks that keep many straight people from applying their general value systems to human rights for all. The irony in my case of being a lifelong activist and not doing the work to get it about Israel is deep and hard to both understand and convey. But I've come to learn that this insistent blindness is pervasive, and I want to use the opportunity of this book to confront and expose my own denial in a way that I hope will be helpful to others. In 2005, an organization called the Palestine Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, PACB, had asked for an academic and cultural boycott and also an economic boycott. And the more that I researched this, the more I began to feel that this nonviolent strategy was actually the most effective strategy for change of any strategy that I was hearing about in the Middle East. And then I got an email from PACB in Ramallah, West, uh, West Bank, from Omar Barghouti of PACB, who's a straight Palestinian leader. Dear Professor Shulman, thank you for your taking this principled stance. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, I wonder what he thinks about queer people. So I wrote Omar Barghouti back and I said, well, if I come to Ramallah, will you meet with me to talk about queer politics? And he said yes. And then it was time to go to the, to the West Bank. Um, a bunch of anarchists, Jewish anarchists, took me in their car. At that time, it was illegal for um, internationals to do this, but they, we drove to a village called Berlin, which is one of those places where the wall of separation is between the people's homes and their olive trees. And they've been having demonstrations every Friday for seven years. And there's about 1,200 people who live there. And it was, you know, they're marching around and singing and having slogans and all of that. And then all of a sudden, these Israeli soldiers appear. And they start shooting tear gas. And nothing has been happening. You know, and I'm watching this, and this is a kind of tear gas that tells you, tells your brain that you're suffocating. It's a neurological gas. And I'm looking at these Israeli soldiers, and it's so weird because they look exactly like me. And you know, I grew up in New York City, right? And I'm used to people who look like me being like teachers or like dentists or something like that, not being soldiers and bullies with, not being part of the state apparatus, because in general, my experience of Jews is that they don't join the state apparatus in the United States. They don't tend to become cops and soldiers and this kind of thing. And I'm looking at these people, and then um, I get in this group taxi to go to Ramallah to meet Omar, and all of a sudden this thing happened inside me where I just asked this question to myself, like, who is we? You know, and I realize now that it's a question that everybody has to ask themselves. But when you talk to people about Israel and Palestine, a lot of Jews will say, they want to push us into the sea, right? It's they, they are one thing and we are one thing. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I am not we with these soldiers. And my whole sense of we changed. And suddenly I felt like my we are people all over the world who want some kind of secular democratic life. Who, who are leaning towards feminism, who are leaning towards um, gay people in some way. And I know that that's a very narrow definition, but the thing is there are people like that everywhere. So when I get to Ramallah, I meet um, with a group of people, a group of queer people and straight people. Like most of the queers I'm about to meet, he doesn't like Fatah or Hamas and has his own vision for Palestine. You know, and I was like, my friends don't like the Democrats or the Republicans. Why would I not think that there's people like me everywhere 
who don't, are not into the political offerings that are being presented to them and don't support the party. You know, and it's so obvious that every society is a multidimensional society. And yet it took me having to go there to understand that. And so all, this, all these processes were about thinking it through for myself, which I had to be in my 50s to do that, which is something I'm embarrassed about. But I, you know, I just didn't have the mechanism. And once I started, everything opened. So I just want to say, you know, I wrote this book because I thought there's a lot of people like me. There's people who know that what's going on, there's something profoundly wrong. They, they're afraid of looking at it because they think it's so complicated. And there's so much rabid ideology. You know, it's, as soon as you start to understand it, it's like this is a system where there's a, a theory of racial supremacy where that Jews have privileges and rights that Palestinians don't have, and that Palestinians are subjugated, and they don't have basic self-determination. And that's simple. You know, and I've had a million arguments since then with people, almost every day. My Facebook page is filled with this. And people will try to come up with something from history and some little fact that I don't know and some argument. But it doesn't matter because there's nothing that proves that racial supremacy is justified. There's no fact in history that makes it justified. So it's a, it's a useless argument. And Vijay and I are very different, but he's on a similar journey. And that's why we came together tonight to talk to you. So now he's going to read to you from his. As the late congressman uh, from the United States used to like to say, India and Israel share the same extremist enemy, which was Islam. 9-11 occurred and a considerable section of the intelligentsia began to suggest, in, in the United States, that is the Indian intelligentsia, and the, began to suggest that we need to take lessons from, on the one hand, Jews in America, because how is it that such a small population has so much power? That was their thinking. And second, how do we differentiate ourselves from Muslims? Planes crash, people are smashed here and there, there and here. Please do not take my blunt words to heart, uncle. You have been good to me. You have been good to many of us. But why does my stomach still clench when someone with a badge approaches me? thinking in my churned head that my time has come. I am going to be led to a plane and sent back to where I came from. Is it because that badge has started stopping me more often these past 10 years, asking me why I am where I am, where I am going, what I believe in? Who are these people with badges, uncle, and why do they stare at me? I have heartburn, uncle. I will take to drink. I will take to drugs. I will take to watching TV, eating fast food, going into debt. I will not exfoliate. I will not eat salad. I will not read the newspaper. I cannot wear my headscarf. I cannot grow my beard. I cannot speak my name and allow its poetry to ring through the air. You send American aid all around, throwing money and cheese at the world's poor. Even that aid is money you have borrowed from others. Lords are thieves whose theft is proper. But uncle, there is no aid for us. All we want is your kindness and a little decency. Your obedient servant, Vijay Prashad. Obviously, this is a lot of pressure on any community. And certainly, the greatest escape hatch that appeared was to take advantage of Islamophobia. So for instance, when there was an attack at the Gurdwara in Wisconsin, people said, look, we are not them. We are Sikhs. We are not Muslim. But the truth is that nobody makes these distinctions. The fact is we are all terrorists. We all look like terrorists. You know, you can't make this distinction. These are immoral distinctions. But even more immoral is to say, let us make an alliance with those who really hate Muslims. And so the American Jewish Committee, APAC, came and gave lessons to this section of the Indian American community. And they had events together where they began to talk about the common extremist enemy. And since this had been something that I had been part of since the 1980s, uh, I was very active in pursuing in my community uh, the position that we must not be involved in this kind of 
Islamophobia because the fact is the racist doesn't care whether you're really the terrorist. The racist thinks you're a terrorist and that's enough. So that's also the reason why I've been involved with the US version of the boycott. Not because I have any special antipathy to Israel. Not because Israel is the sole focus of my existence. But principally because I find it embarrassing twofold. On the one hand, the United States is its principal enabler through the United Nations, through you know, its blockage of any kind of censure or sanctions. And India is its major subsidizer by buying half its weapons. So twice over, I feel responsible for caste lead. Twice over, I feel responsible for pillar of defense. This is not about Jews. This is not about Muslims. This is not about Israelis. This is not about Palestinians. For me, it's also about all the enablers. And among them, I am also there. The images of terrified Israelis, rightly or wrongly, are back in the front of my mind. And what sinks into my mind is, how are we ever going to lift up this story uh, in this news cycle or in any news cycle? Um, how is the suffering of the Palestinian people ever going to be taken seriously? Um, when, when I was in Ramallah the first time, and right after my story ended there, we, and I have a chapter on this, I got together with all these activists and we were talking about how to make change. And one of the things I've really come to believe is that Israel can't change. It's the United States that has to change. We, they, we are spending eight and a half million dollars a day on military aid to Israel. They cannot do what they do if we don't fund it. And so the question is, how does the United States change? Now, I'm fortunate in that I have lived through some very profound paradigm changes in the US, particularly around people with AIDS, for example. And I know that there can be enormous transform transformation in the US. But the way it works is that change never comes from the center. It never comes from the mainstream. In the United States, change comes from subcultures. And the reason that is so is that our subcultures are so alienated from mainstream culture that we have our own leaders, we have our own publications, we have our own discourse, our own vocabulary, we have our own people who we trust. We do not trust dominant culture. And so you can have real personal and complex humane debates within our subcultures that are never seen in a big stage. Secular Jews, Arab Americans, African Americans, LGBT, artists, academics, students that these were seven key groups that are ready to move forward on Palestine and have their own constructions, internal constructions for discussion and their own leadership and that that leadership can help move them forward. I'm in a number of those communities, but the community that I have the most connection to is the LGBT community. And I decided that I would try to do some things to make Palestine a mainstream discussion in that community. So we're going from you know, just a few people, to now, it's, it is a now a mainstream conversation in that subculture. And other people are doing it in their communities. That's where it's coming from. And then, it's, it, in the, the way it works in America, that suddenly it appears in the mainstream. So I think that that's the strategy. And I think the past has shown that it can work, and it's a viable strategy. So I'm not hopeless. It used to be that the easiest ticket to whiteness was to be anti-black. Now you have a sort of a get out of jail card. You don't necessarily have to be anti-black as long as you're anti-Muslim. You know, it's an easy way to become an American. You know, you stand up against the tyranny of Islam or whatever. And that is a trajectory there. And that has to be defeated. And it has to be defeated by speaking clearly against it. So I find there is an acknowledgement that things are shifting. You know, I appreciate your subculture geography. You know, you laid out a geography that we are going to encircle the city, OK? <laughs> All the different subcultures will. And in fact, that's what we believe, right? The margins move the mainstream. Mainstream is too stupid to know it needs to walk. Margins will move it. I appreciate that. And I think as that has occurred, in the last five or six years, there is a new fear among the older generation. And so the backlash has become quite virulent. People are exhausted by the intractability of this problem, the intractability of the vocabulary. You know, I mean, we call it a conflict. It's not a conflict, it's an occupation. 
you know, the intractability of the problem, the words that I use, the sense of just, I think, exhaustion. That is, even I find young people exhausted by this issue already. And I think that's a very profound thing, that if you're exhausted in your youth, maybe you will then take the aspirin that we are offering and come and see us the next morning, you know, so. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks a lot.